Hello, welcome to another R Sharks previews video. To be clear, these are not reviews. These are sponsored previews being done as part of our R Sharks digital convention. And without further ado, let's jump into our first game here. Mantis Falls, a game of trust. Now listen, we've all been there. You've witnessed a horrible crime in the 1940s in a gangster run uh, town and now you have to get out of dodge before they catch up with you you and another player or possibly a third player as well but I'm not going to go into that too much that's a variant within the game that is a thing you and another person are going to be working together to try and get out of town moving along this road now you're only ever going to be able to see one space ahead of you on this road and moving along is going to gradually reveal things and sometimes these roads are going to be uneventful and safe and have nice things like phone booths where if you think you might be in trouble you can make a phone call and get some help. Or maybe less good things like broken bits of road that you can't get past and I've got some terrible news along the way. You're probably going to have some bad times with the gangsters trying to catch up with you who probably want you dead. Now the first problem here to be absolutely transparent is that one of you might not actually be who they say they are. One of you is a witness to a terrible thing. The other one might be an assassin, pretending to be your friend, trying to get you out of town because they were involved in something bad too, you know, but actually maybe they're lying, maybe they're an assassin. On the other hand, maybe they're not. Maybe you're both witnesses and you're both actually working together. So this is a game which is cooperative, but there's a chance that the person you're cooperating with does not have your interests at heart. Now the box actually describes this as being like life, uh, where you know you feel like you're working with people but actually they're trying to kill you. Not really my experience, but sometimes people can get a bit aggro. How you actually play the game is going to be very dependent on the action cards that you have in your hand. There's a whole bunch of different suits of action cards, and on your turn you can play as many as you want from the same suit. And while in a two player game of this you are going to be taking it in turns, really on both turns you're doing a lot of things. So. I could, for example, choose three different cards that were on the same suit, and I would choose the order that I wanted to play them in, from left to right. The other player on the other side, let's just say these are the same, might play two cards, and again, left to right. And then the way things actually resolve themselves at the end of the round is by me turning over a card, resolving that, them turning over a card, resolving that, and vice versa, going left to right on my side, left to right on their side, until everything has been resolved. But what is there to resolve? Well, uh, events. Now every turn we're going to be pulling out an event card. And basically at the start of your turn you're going to be taking and looking at an event card from the top of the deck and not showing it to the other player. Now there's two different types of events here, unseen and seen incidents. Now if an incident is seen, then you will show it to the other player. You'll put it on the table and say, look, this is what's happening. Then, you know, we've got to work this out together. However, if the card is unseen, you are not allowed to show it to the other player. And these get resolved at the end of the turn, which means you basically have a problem at the start of the turn, you both do your best to resolve it, and at the end you resolve it based on what's happened. And the unseen <laughs> things actually resolve with you still never looking at the card. There is something in the manual that basically says you have to do it properly, otherwise that's just cheating. However, you don't have to be 100% honest about why things happen or how things happen, which means it might say, for example, in the manual it says it might say, well, you know, you have to distribute three wounds between the two characters, but you could just tell the other player that they have to take three wounds and not explain why if, for example, you are an assassin or someone who's just really paranoid and thinks that the other person's an assassin. Not really sure this is actually a strictly cooperative game, but it's certainly an interesting one to start things off with. And there's a lot of wiggle room here about how things actually resolve when cards are played. For example, a lot of action cards will have something that says sometimes on the bottom, which means the criteria won't always be there, which means, oh no, accidentally, you might have just been hurt by my action. I maybe didn't mean that. And as you curve around this nasty road to try and get out of town, the different cards you reveal are gonna have different properties on them, which are gonna to correspond to the cards that you play and have different effects. For example, if you are a witness, you probably wanna stay near to a telephone, um, otherwise you might get murdered in the night. Now the game ends when all players have actually reached the end of the road, and then you discover whether or not the person who's with you is, is actually good or not, or if one of the players 
has died. If you're the assassin, then you win if the witness is killed. If you're the witness, you win if you survive. And if both people die, then I don't think anybody wins, which I think is arguably, again, a good metric for life. Now, if you'll excuse me crashing into the party like this, there's a whole bunch of stuff within this box, including uh, some little bags to keep all of the different decks of cards in. But crucially, you have three mini expansions here, and I should, I'd should i be remiss not to point out an actions bag that has a picture of a hedgehog on it. Don't really understand the, uh, the connection between hedgehogs and gritty film noir crime, but I'm here for it. And... They're arguably one of these is more important than the others. There's an expansion in this called Full Circle, which is basically introducing special character archetypes, loads of other actions, and it's very clear in the manual to repeatedly say that you really want to be playing this with this expansion to add more complexity to this horrible cooperative game. And the last detail I want to shine a little light on is the way that murdering people or dying works in this game. It's a pretty neat system called the last gasp system, which means that effectively you only have a certain number of wounds that you can take before you die, and the basic characters without the expansions just have eight. Then when you hit that number, immediately what you're going to do is have a last gasp, which means you're going to completely stop play. You're going to stop the flow of this left to right action stuff, and you are going to be able to play a round's worth of action cards, boom, 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 without anyone else doing anything else and see what happens. If at the end of that action, you've managed to get your health back down below that uh, kind of margin, then you're still alive and you're back and you move your last gasp symbol one space along. If you've ever had three last gasps, it doesn't matter. You, you've, you've had enough of that, honestly. You've been very melodramatic. But it does mean that when trying to perhaps cause somebody to die, they might not die and they might just suddenly go, <gasps> and have a real moment and do loads of stuff that you weren't really expecting in a way that is not helpful. Like I keep assuming that I'm an assassin. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm a nice witness, just like you. Anyway, that is a brief introduction to Mantis Falls, a game of trust for two to three players. Goodness gracious, game is bodacious. Those were my first words when I unpacked and looked at this new second edition of Atlantis Rising, uh, published by Elf Creek Games and designed by Gallen Kiskel and Brent Dickman. This is a new, stunningly good looking second edition of 2012 cooperative game Atlantis Rising with art by Vincent Dutre. I've played a lot of games with art by Vincent Dutre. This is absolutely my favorite. And I'm just gonna show you one thing that I, I really, really like a great deal. Um, these are the player boards um, that you can uh, play as. If you flip them, you can be exactly the same character, um, but change the gender. And in fact, there is one character who's non-binary and by flipping their sheet, uh, you simply make them younger or older. I think that's just so classy. But then everything about this new second edition is classy. Look at this little hologram person. Look at your workers and your leaders and your little volunteers and your resources and these things known as mystic energy, this double level punch board. I had, I, I didn't realize, but I have, you have to assemble this board from all little different jigsaw pieces. Um, I had so much fun doing that before I'd even learned how to play the game, just jigsawing this board together. Um, Look at these dice as well. This game is truly stunning. Um, I think it's it's probably not an exaggeration to say that Elf Creek Games might be making the, the best looking board games uh, around right now. Is that true? I don't know. I've said it now, it's out in the wild. How do you play Atlantis Rising? Um, it's actually pretty simple for a game that looks as crazy and as complicated as this. Um, a bunch of players, uh, a number of which is, that's up to you, my friend, uh, are gonna be trying to save Atlantis, which is currently sinking into the sea, and you're gonna be trying to build crazy engines and this, socketing them into this gorgeous board. Um, and once you've, the objective is to fill this entirely with cool Atlantean inventions, and only then do all the players have the ability to all work together to build the power core, which is gonna open a sort of stargate to a nice place, which is where you're trying to get to because Atlantis is sinking. I've just realized they've made a horrible mistake calling this Atlantis Rising because Atlantis is sinking. That's what the whole game is about. Look, uh, as you play this game, tiles are going to be sinking. Atlantis is going to be sinking into the sea. And what are you going to do about it? Well, there's not much you can do, honestly. That's the whole point of the game. That's why you're trying to escape. How do you play the game, Quinn? Stop being excited and start telling me about turn structure. Um, oh, on that note, I will just say, 
Atlantis Rising has my favorite turn structure of any game uh, I've looked at uh, in a while. The turn structure of Atlantis Rising is one, place Atlanteans, two, suffer misfortunes, three, take actions, four, endure the wrath of the gods. That doesn't get you excited to play a cult game, what will? Um, but practically speaking, this game is actually really pretty simple. So with the objective of building these cool devices, which, by the way, are randomized um, each time you play. Lots of things are randomized, both random characters, random inventions, and random cards in the Misfortune deck, random artifacts in the library. Uh, you're gonna need materials to, to build stuff here. Um, and so we're gonna be playing kind of a cooperative worker placement game. To begin with, in this four player game we've got set up here, everyone, it, with no particular turn order, is simply gonna place people where they wanna go on these different worker placement slots. And um, each of the six kind of legs of the, the starfish that is Atlantis produces a different kind of thing. So for example, you get gold here, you get ore here, you process ore into uh, Atlantanium or something equally stupid. Let's look up what it actually is. No, no, it was at Atlantium. Okay, great. You can process all into Atlantium here. You get uh, cool cards from the library here. You get new workers here and you get crystals and stuff here. Um, but players are gonna be placing all of these workers and the key decision you're making here is where to place workers down the leg because the further you go down a leg, the better the, or easier it is to get rewards, but the greater the chance you have of, oh no, uh, drowning, basically. Um, because after everyone has placed all of their workers on this little spider, um, step two, every player is going to draw a misfortune card, which may or may not drown a particular region. Obviously, if your worker is standing on a bit of Atlantis that sinks, well, they don't die, but you do get that worker back, meaning you were greedy, you were greedy for just even trying to get a good and easy reward, and now you're gonna get no reward. Um, then once everyone's drawn a misfortune card and you've resolved everything, players then resolve their worker placement spaces in any order, often by just rolling dice. Um, collecting resources is pretty simple. You roll a dice, you roll one of these big beautiful dice, and if you get equal to or higher than the number that's required, you get that resource. And then either way, the worker comes home. Um, what's cool here though, is to get new workers, um, which is an action that of course, anyone who's played a worker game, placement game will know is important. Um, these are actually double slots. So you have to send two of your workers or you work together with someone else. Um, and then the two of you are gonna roll a dice together. And if added together, you get a high enough number one of you will get a new worker. Um, I've done two rolls on camera right now, live, and I've failed both of the numbers that I was aiming for, but that's okay. Mystic Energy is a resource that um, all players have, and you can spend Mystic Energy to just bump up your dice rolls, just bump them up. Um, so that's good. You can also get more Mystic Energy by sending workers to the center of the board. Um, however, as you're gathering resources, eventually you will want to use them for something. And that is why another of the working placement spaces is to go uh, into the kind of hub world, which is this disc sort of represents this area, I think. And you can do that to build cool devices which will uh, help you out uh, by spending resources. And two players who each have some of the resources you need can work together to build something. A lot of working together in this. I always love that in co-op games. Little excuses, little mechanics. To, to let you pull your chair up next, next to someone and go, hey, we can do this if we work together. Feeling really twee today, I think. Um, anyway, so you have placed your workers, then you resolved your disasters, then you resolved your actions, and finally, suffer the wrath of the gods. Um, that's what this lovely wrath track is for. At the beginning of the game, the zero here means you don't have to do anything, but at the end of every turn, you're gonna slide this one to the right, and in future Wrath of the God phases, that number is how many segments of Atlantis you as a group need to pick and sink. So um, even if you get lucky with the deck, there will be some mandatory sinking and some tough discussions, presumably, um, with regarding which action spaces you can afford to sacrifice. It's like, oh, I, I think we can get rid of these places. And someone else goes, no, I like those places. Um, I should mention, what else should I mention? I should mention that all of the individual player boards have unique powers. Um, that your leader token has, and often, I love this, um, this will relate to nudging dice uh, in the area that your leader is. So, you know, you can send your leader over here, and then if my friends send their workers to use that space, my leader might give all my friends a buff because they're being a leader. Come on, you know what a leader does. Um, another mechanic I really like, these are little pretty gate tokens. Several actions during the game will let you place gate tokens and that those gates will hold the water back and prevent areas from flooding. Also, you have the ability to deflood things, um, or uh, anti-flood, I'm sure there's a word for deflooding thing. Drain, you can drain the land again. 
um, and flipping back over, and that might buy you a little extra time. And the thing is, for a game with all of these components, um, I was expecting the rules to be more complicated, but no, this is like not significantly more complicated than Pandemic. It's just gorgeous and full of so much, so much beautiful art. I think I'm going to be keeping this game after the Sharks previews so I can have a sneaky little play myself. Um, because yes, frankly, any excuse to spend more time with these components, uh, I will I will jump at. Um, thanks, Elf Creek Games. Thanks for making something so very beautiful. Uh, let's see what our next game that we're going to be looking at is. Scooby Dooby Doo. Where are you? You're here. You're here in this game. In this game called Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, a coded chronicles game uh, from the OP games. This is part of a series of escape room style games and this box is designed by Jake Cormier and Sen Fun Ling. And this is cool, okay? This is really neat. This is part of the sort of escape room style puzzle solving game you might have seen in the form of Unlock. Um, and oh, if you've not seen this game before, I'm gonna show you some cool stuff. Let's set up the game. You ready? Done. That's it. That's all that's involved. In this game, you and your friends are going to be piloting um, the Scooby-Doo gang uh, through a haunted mansion. The plot of the game sees the mystery reveal, their, their not creepy at all van uh, breaking down outside of a big spooky haunted mansion. They go in for help. Then there's a brief power cut. And then when the lights come on and the game starts, uh, Vel Velma, forgot her name, is alone in this foyer and she's going to try and solve a mystery and also first find where her friends are. The way that this game works, though, is absolutely superbly simple. You and your friends will decide what you want um, a character to interact with. And characters can also move around. There's no, like, spend a movement point. It's like, no. You just pick a character and then pick what they interact with and you're done. And every character in this game has a different verb. Velma, who we start with, can research stuff. Shaggy eats things. Uh, Daphne uses things. Scooby-Doo smells things. And Fred investigates. Uh, but what this means in practice is here, let me show you. At the start of the game we have Velma. If you want Velma to uh, use her research skill on this cupboard, you're going to move the one here next to the cupboard so it becomes the number 1401. And then we're going to look that up in Velma's book, 1401. Uh, foyer. Gingerly reaching out, Velma opens the door to an antique French armoire. She is relieved when nothing leaps out at her except a few dust bunnies. Reveal card one. We reveal card one and look, it's the inside of the cupboard. Uh, I'm not gonna, I, I've played a little bit of this so basically I can walk through some stuff. If you check that box, you're gonna find a key. Ooh, let's get my key. And then look here, the way you uh, combine items with stuff is you put this number at the end. So if we have Velma using this, try, if we want to try the key on this door, we've got one for Velma's research ability, the one, 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 one for the key. So all of the ones, so we're going to try through, and Velma tries the key in the door to the north and it opens! Velma hears muffled voices, but she can't see a soul as she peeks into the room. Attach map tile two, and look. We're expanding outwards. Remove card 34 from play, because we've used this key. I'm gonna speed ahead again a bit, but if you use Velma's ability then on the grand piano to create number one, 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 two, she finds Shaggy, who was hiding in the piano, and now you have a new character and a new verb. Let me make this clear. The fact that Shaggy's verb is eat means you can make Shaggy try and eat literally anything in this game. You can see why this might be quite cool for kids. Um, so what happens, I mean, I'll just do this. I don't know what's gonna happen. What happens if Shaggy tries to eat that armoire we opened before to create number 2401? You know, pop open Shaggy's book. 2401. Be I'm gonna do my best Shaggy now. Being stuck in that piano. I, d I can't even remember how he sounds. This is, dis this is disastrous. Being stuck in that piano sure has made me hungry, but I can't find anything to eat in this closet. I'm just getting higher pitched. Also, British people should not be allowed to do Shaggy. So yeah, the Shaggy book, I'll be honest, I don't think eating stuff is gonna generally be the solution to puzzles, which means the Shaggy book is basically a series of comedy uh, answers if you try and make Shaggy eat different things. 
Um, and that's the game. It's just deciding to interact with different things to try and solve puzzles. Obviously, they're going to be harder than just finding a key and then trying to put it in a door. Um, because, not least, because not only are there going to be a wide variety of puzzles as you explore this mansion and try and unmask a murderer, but we have all of these secret envelopes that I can feel contain more than just cards. There's some thickness in there, there's some components. What's in these envelopes? Oh, I, I, I peeked into the first one and it, it, it immediately introduces a puzzle that's more curious and thought-provoking than, uh, than, than what you've seen so far. I think this is really cool. This is just a really... It's a really lovely kind of tie-in to, to a universe. It's a more characterful escape room game than I've seen uh, in most escape room games. But also, I just love that if you're playing as a family, you know, the parents could be, you know, kind of like, as you unlock more characters, you, could, you hand these books out. So you could have your parents being Fred and Velma, and then the kids can be Shaggy and Scooby and just try and eat and smell absolutely everything. Um, I think this is... Just lovely. What a lovely use of a theme and an IP. What I I just I think I just really like Scooby Doo and being put in this kind of uh, puzzle has it's just put a bit of a smile on my face. It's also nice to see, as always, a game with no plastic whatsoever, uh, which always is especially nice in those games like this, where once you've finished it, you're kind of done with it. So you can trade it on, but also, if you don't have anyone who'd want a copy of this and you put it in the bin, that feels okay, because you're only throwing away paper and cardboard and not plastic. So, a little bit of sustainability there. I, I, I'm, I've been smiling start to finish for my entirety of the time sat with this game. Very, very cool stuff. Let's see what the next game is. Next up in Shark's Preview Land we have Mass Transit, a very, very, very dinky cooperative game from Calliope Games. And this is a game of, excitingly, trying to get six commuters to come home. We've got a tiny setup already on the table to give you a sense of what the game might look like once you get going, and this plays from one to six players and takes about 20 minutes. We have six commuters here and each of them needs to get home to the suburbs. Now these cards are going to pop up as you play, but you're not gonna be able to use them straight away. You'll notice there's a little number in the corner. That means you need to have four steps of transportation routes, etc., before that person can get home to this suburb. You know, you go to work every day, but you might not go home to the same house. It's, it's entirely, I mean, that's relatable to me on multiple levels. So let's just say, for example, here, this would be great. We could just nip home all the way home, taking a series of buses. Ideal. Might not always be that straightforward. At the start of the game, each player is going to have four cards in their hands secretly, and you're not going to be able to communicate with people clearly. Uh, throughout the entire of the game. You can't tell them what you've got. You might say, oh, I love trains, but that's about as explicit as you can be. And every turn as you go around clockwise, you're going to have to play a minimum of two cards or you collectively are going to lose the game. There's loads of different types of cards that you might draw up in your hand. We've already seen the suburb card, which is going to go at the end of a route. Thankfully, if you draw too many of these at the start of the game, you get to put them back in the deck and draw again. And the other cards all really have different types of routes on them, but also different types of modes of transportation. Everything from the humble boat to the humble bus to the humble pedestrian, aka walking around, moving around without a vehicle, and finally trains and null, no, that's not a form of transportation. You can't use that card to do transportation stuff. Because each of these cards effectively has two things it can do. It can either be placed as part of a route onto the board, so I might go, oh, okay, let's put that there. Or I could use that same card for its transportation function. In this case, I would say, I'm gonna play this card to allow a person to do just a little walk. Do, 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 do. Now walking, as we've covered, just lets you move somebody one card long, which is not super productive if you have eight miles to go. However, if you're playing another type of card, for example, if I was going to play a card that had a bus at the top of it, then I could move this character up to the next bus stop station, and then they have to stop and get another bus over here. And the same rules apply on all of the other types of routes. So you have train stations here, and here, you've got a bus station here, and a little boat station here. Boat station? I don't think they call them that, but I'm going to call them that from now on. 
This again though is still quite free and easy and breezy in terms of having problems that might pop up. Now a key thing with the demonstration I've just given you is I've lured you into a false sense of security because actually no you wouldn't be able to get a bus from here to here because this bus stop stops the road stops and it means that you can't actually get back on a bus until you get to the next bus station which is all the way over here so you'd have to walk two spaces and imagine if you just got a boat here well that's the end of the boat road and there's no road road from that station so the only option you have would be to walk to the next card and keep walking until you reach the next station because although we have a completely connected uh, train line just down here not connected very well in my wobbly world you can't just jump onto a train as it goes by you need to get on at a station so yes, you might now be beginning to see why these cards that might clog up your hand are not ideal. Often the yellow cards will not only be unplayable as transportation cards, they'll also have some dead ends in for you to possibly contend with. But remember, you have to play two cards each turn. You can play more if you want, but you have to play two. And there's cards that are worse than that. This is a fantastic example of a not great card. First of all, it has an exclamation mark in the corner. That means that when you have this card in your hand, by the end of your turn, you have to have played it. Now you could play it to be activating a boat station to a boat station. I've got to stop saying boat station. Or you could use it to play as I have done here, but you have to use it before the end of your turn. And secondly, you'll notice there's a traffic light symbol here, which means if somebody is going to say make this person walk here and then spends a bus card to move this person along this bus route here they have not yet reached another bus station however they have been held up in traffic and because they're still on that bus they can't get off it so actually in this case you would move them and put them maybe sideways so you'd say look that person is still stuck on a bus they, they they're in traffic and they would have to then play another bus card to move along to the next bus station and it's just it's not ideal traffic what are you going to do so you're just going to keep on going round step by step playing cards on your turn and then rotating around the table rotating what is going on with my words today in the fashion that you're probably used to from playing any game and you're either going to win by getting all six of these people back home to the safety of the suburbs this one still needs four, so we'd have to spend that another one there to fill that out. They've got quite a long way to go, and you've got six people. They've all got to go somewhere. <laughs> I'm sorry, they do. And then that's it. Of course, you've only got this deck of cards, and you're always drawing up cards every turn. And if at any point you cannot play two cards on your turn, or if at any point this deck runs out, which sits in the middle of the table quite nicely, then, yeah, unfortunately, that's game over. You lost. And you can only, I guess, just celebrate the people who did manage to make it home to their families. What happened to the others? We will never know. And you should stop asking. And that is Mass Transit, a cooperative game of just trying to get home. Um, oh, yeah, I really don't miss the London Underground. See you soon. Next up, we are looking at Deckscape, Crew vs. Crew, The Pirate Island, a pocket escape room game, published by D.V. Giocchi. Now this is one of those games that's an escape room in a box. Now you might have heard of a couple of other popular escape room board game series. There's the Exit series, which you destroy as you play through. There's the Unlock series, which requires an app. D.V. Giocchi's efforts, the Deckscape boxes, but also the Detective boxes, which I quite like, um, are replayable as many times as you like and come in these very small boxes. To show you what's in this one though, come on over my shoulder. So, there is really no better way to show you how Deckscape works than to just play it with you. So this is a game without a manual, it's just a deck of cards. Now these cards are both going to run the game for you and teach you how to play. So, this is informing us that in this game, we're gonna have red and blue teams competing to get to the pirate's treasure first. It instructs us to split players into red crews and blue crews, and if one of the crews is weaker, they're gonna get four special golden coins to start. We've got a little backstory. It's the late 18th century in the Caribbean. We're trying to steal a treasure map. 
Now the red team and the blue team are each going to get a similar but slightly different clue card about seals on the governor's desks. We've got more rules of how to play. And we have our first puzzle. There are four letters on the governor's desk. Three he wrote to send, while the one that contains the treasure map arrived only recently. By looking at the wax seals and the available stamps, which is the letter containing the map? Ah, oh, and the answer is that if you think about these letters and the imprint they create, if they were reversed, one of these letters could not have been created with the stamps on the desk. And then the team that got that right is going to get some victory, some gold coins. But if a team got the answer wrong, those coins are going straight to the other team. And now we've got some more rules as to how to win. The team that collects the most coins is going to win the game. Oh, and we're straight on to our next puzzle. Three pirate ships. We've got to try and steal the one with the most black skulls and crossbones on it. But which ship would that be? Can you figure out which of these ships has the most skulls and crossbones on it? Can you? Can you? Can you? If you can, maybe it's time for you to buy Dexgate Crew vs. Crew, the Pirate's Island, a pocket escape room game. I do like these escape room games. I find them very charming, interesting, and it's frankly ridiculous just how many puzzles the designers of them have been able to create. I have played so many portable little escape room games now, and they continue to blow my tiny mind. This is Doctor Who Time of the Daleks, a cooperative game for a number of doctors. Now, immediately we've got around the big problem with licensed games like this of I want to play as the main character in the fact that obviously you're all playing as the doctor at the same time. There are four playable doctors within the box. Doctor number one, doctor number four, doctor number 13, and doctor number 11. I know it's been a while, but the fourth doctor really does look a lot like Boris Johnson in a wig. Now this is a simple adventure game where you're going to be trying to get around the board all the way from Scaro, through Earth, through time, until you get back to Gallifrey. But if the Daleks make it to Gallifrey first, then bad news, you've lost. And also, if you get so many Daleks appearing through time and space that the big bad Dalek Davros turns up, then you've also lost. At the start of the game, you're each going to pick the Doctor you'd like to start playing as, and also which kind of TARDIS board you'd like, from a variety of different eras of the TV show, including this black and white one, which honestly looks like a bunch of grandchildren deeply disappointed that Grandad's about to drop another lacklustre DJ set. On your turn, you're not actually going to move the TARDIS around through time and space. Instead, you're going to choose to go and have an adventure somewhere in the universe. Now, you can sort of choose where you want to go, but sometimes you can't, as is quite common with the TARDIS. You're going to roll the TARDIS dice and perhaps you're going to get to choose where the TARDIS goes, but perhaps you're not, and you're going to have to just take a new location tile from this stack. If that's the case, we put it on the table and go, okay, it's Alabama, 1955 in the past, and Punjab, 1947 in the past. We have two different parts of this one location, and with it, we have two different dilemmas that also get added to the pastiche. We've got the Shimsha, Shimmy Shimmy Sha, and we have an impossible astronaut, well, the impossible astronaut, if we're going to be correct about things. Now, these locations and these problems slot together to create fantastic hybrid problem situations, otherwise known as adventures. Your doctor is going to get pulled to that or jump to it of their own volition, depending on how lucky you are with the TARDIS dice, and then it's up to you to try and resolve this situation. Now, let's just say that I'm playing as the 11th doctor, Matt Smith. He gets four black dice and one blue dice initially in order to add to his roll pool of things that he can use to try and resolve situations. But of course, a doctor is no use without companions. And that's why throughout the game, you're going to be putting underneath your lovely little board down here some companions that you find from either Earth or other planets. Companions are going to let you re-roll certain colors of dice, change black dice into different new colours of dice, or simply add brand new coloured dice to your pool, with the rule being that you're not allowed to have more than eight dice that you're rolling when you actually try and attempt one of these challenges, which are as simple as they look. If you roll all of these things after you've spent all of your re-rolls and all of that stuff, then you've successfully done it. If not, you have failed. But in addition to companions, you've also got some other stuff, such as equipment and other things in a, I'm going to say this once, in a deck of 
Timey wimey cards, that's really what they're called. It's written on the back of the cards. I've said it once, I'm not gonna say it again. I like the TV show, but come on now, there's a limit. We've got the timey wimey cards, and that, that allows me to have, I've done it twice already, done. Okay, never mind. TARDIS library, the doctor's ring, and we're all stories in the end. A lot of this equipment is gonna require that you use charges in your sonic screwdriver, which you're gonna be collecting every turn in order to expend it. And you can also spend charges from your sonic screwdriver to re-roll dice or flip dice to any side you want to get yourself out of a scrape. Additionally, because arguably you are all just one person split throughout time and space, you can offer to help each other when performing these tasks. If you actually come to their location physically, then you can roll a bunch of dice of their pool and then you've got a split between you of the abilities you can use to get the better rolls, or if you're going to try and help them across time and space, you just get to roll one of their dice. But again, still use all of your powers to try and sway it in your favour. After all of your rolls and re-rolls and flips and all of that jazz, you've managed to achieve the requirements of that adventure, then you get the little bonus that's printed on the bottom of it, which is usually moving your TARDIS forward some spaces. And the final twist here is there are some time anomalies dotted around the board. When the Daleks hit them, it's not good and you're gonna get time anomaly cards appearing as new locations and new problems you're gonna to have to try and fix. But also they allow you to do stuff that you wouldn't usually be able to do, like being in the same space at the same time and helping people out. Basically all the stuff that doesn't really make sense if you're a fan of the TV show. And finally, you know, this is a pretty simple game as things go, but there's a whole stack of different locations, all of them from the TV show throughout the years, a whole bunch of different dilemmas, which are effectively different types of aliens and creatures and problems. And mixing all of this stuff up is quite tasty. And finally, there's also the fact that when you are going to find companions, at the start of every adventure, you get to draw a new companion, depending on whether or not you're on Earth or on an alien planet. If you succeed the adventure, you get to keep that companion with you until you're bored of them. And it's a simple but pleasing touch that a lot of these cards are linked to other cards, which means if you've got a companion or a piece of equipment or even a location that says linked, then it means that when you go to get a piece of equipment or a companion, rather than just drawing from the deck, you can go and find the specific character or thing that is linked with that person. It's a small touch that ties together this simple cooperative adventure game and I've no doubt that pairing up Jenny Flint with Vastra once again will bring a tear and a small bit of joy to the eyes of any Doctor Who fan that exists in time or space. And that's a brief introduction to Doctor Who, Time of the Daleks. This is Set A Watch, Swords of the Coin, a standalone expansion to the original Set A Watch, a cooperative adventure puzzle combat game where you alone, or you and up to three extra friends, will defend your camp against an onslaught of ghouls. Something important to note here is that Swords of the Coin is an entirely standalone expansion, so you can play it straight out of the box with all of these new characters and new systems and new monsters, or if you want, you can combine it with the original, either the regular or deluxe version we have here that adds this mat and coins, etc, etc. So, with that out of the way, let's talk about how you set this game up. The first thing you'll do is pick an adventurer. The game comes with six straight out the box and whichever adventurer you pick, you'll take their board, their dice and their ability cards, laying them all out in front of you. After everyone has chosen their characters, we'll prepare the various decks in the game. A location deck featuring all the places we're gonna visit, a creature deck with all the monsters we're gonna fight, where you can adjust the difficulty by slipping in the summon cards, as well as the unhallowed deck. These are extra tough monsters that go off to the side. And last but not least, a new addition to Swords of the Coin, the merchant's deck with lots of nice tasty item cards. Then we'll set the fire to seven, ready to start our first game by visiting our first location. The game is played over nine rounds, corresponding to the nine cards in this location deck. And each round is made up of a camp phase and a watch phase. But before embarking on any of that, each player rolls their dice and sets them in front of them. You'll then choose one player to go on camp phase and the rest, the other three, will all go on watch. Now it'll probably make more sense for me to talk about camp phase last in the context 
of what the watch phase is, which is the meat of the set a watch experience. Once everyone is ready to go on watch, we will start by drawing the location for this round. We are on a ley line, and this shows us that we need to draw six enemies into the line for the first round. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then we check how high our fire is blazing. We have got two enemies revealed because our fire is nice and bright, so the first two enemies in the line get revealed. We are up against a frost worm and a bone knight. Great. Some of the enemies in this deck are going to have effects when they're revealed, but luckily these enemies just have effects when they're defeated or in first position, this slot here. So we'll talk about those when they happen. Now, the real meat of the game is in this puzzle. You are trying to get rid of as many enemies in this line as possible because any that are left over are gonna come back and haunt you a bit later. So collectively, you're gonna try and start strategizing. And how are you gonna beat these things? Well, the first thing you can always do is spend your dice to do direct attacks. The Barbarian is a melee character, so he can only fight the things right in front of him. But luckily, he's got this 10 dice, so he can spend a 10 dice to do 10 damage to this Bone Knight, taking him out of the game. And then the rest of the line will move up accordingly. Now, you're probably looking at these dice and thinking, none of these are particularly high. How are we going to continually kill things that have like 8 or 9 or 10 health? Well, that's when your abilities come in. Each character has a set of three abilities that they can exhaust to use. So, for example, this barbarian that I'm using before can leap, exhaust this ability to defeat one creature in the line, and then gain one range for the rest of the round. Easy peasy. In addition to this, some characters might also have passive abilities that will help them out, or an ability on the bottom of their sheet that will define their character. And in Swords of the Coin, the standalone expansion, you can buy yourself items that will also help you in combat, giving you more exhaustible effects to deal with monsters quicker. Now, at the end of the round, you might have a situation like this, where you've got just one monster left, and that is not good enough, because any monsters that are left over at the end of the fight will go into the horde over here, and that's going to come back and haunt you later. I promise we'll talk about it later on. But that is a single round. You'll be trying to fight these monsters in a little puzzly piece of combat using your dice and abilities and passives and items to best get through the deck. Now, all of that sounds a bit exhausting, which is why one player gets to spend their whole turn just chilling out at camp, chopping wood for the fire to make it brighter, looking at the map to see what's coming next, maybe healing up or changing their equipment or looking at all the horrible things that are gonna kill their friends next turn. What a joy! Instead of directly helping to bash monsters in the watch phase, the player that is in camp will instead spend their dice to do various actions here that will help their team out indirectly, like healing or maybe even just refreshing their own character or interacting with the deck of creatures that they didn't get to kill in the watch phase. The player that is in camp can also spend the money they have earned on buying various items that will help them out in the watch phase as well. This is a new addition in Swords of the Coin. Any items they take can be equipped to their character for use in later watch phases. So that is the general structure of the game. You have a camp phase where you interact with this board over here and then a watch phase where you fight a load of monsters. And you keep doing this for every single location until you get to the final location in the game. The final location is the culmination of the entire game, and as such, no player will go on camp. They will all be on watch for this round, and that's especially important as not only do you draw an absolute load of monsters to go into the line, but also, all the monsters you didn't kill that were in the horde get placed as a face-down stack at the end. It's a ferocious number to have to deal with. Players will have to use every single skill and item at their disposal in this last round, and they'll have to work together as a four for the first time, combining their skills and items in ways they didn't think were possible. And if they manage to defeat every single enemy in the line, then they will share the victory together. So that is set a watch in a nutshell, but I haven't mentioned maybe the most important part of the game, which is that each of these characters is entirely different. The Heretic has abilities that will manipulate the graveyard, the Bounty Hunter will take trophies of any creature he defeats, the Barbarian has massive dice and great abilities, but gets very tired doing it. The Witch has a familiar and can see into the future, the Monk can upgrade his dice by meditating in camp, and the Artificer has a cool magic stick. 
I've got to say, I'm quite impressed with how much game fits inside such a little dinky box. And all these character designs seem unique and interesting, so you can play through it multiple times with different configurations. And as well as that, the deluxe components are really nifty. These nice coins, this nice bag they come in, and the cloth board and the wooden camp tokens, it's very sweet. And I also neglected to mention, there's a tiny mini expansion, the Outriders expansion, that adds like riders that snap together. It seems suitably bonkers. So that is all of Set a Watch, a nice little game for up to four players. And if you're in the mood for a combat puzzly dungeon crawler in a small box, then it's probably worth checking out from Rock Manor Games.